This video was brought to you by Squarespace. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, throughout history, there have been many examples of ships that left their ports and were simply never seen again. Most of the time, these ships were sunk or destroyed on their journeys, but occasionally there are ships whose fates are more mysterious. Here are four real ghost ships whose haunting tales remain a mystery to this day. Number four, the SS Beichimo. The Beichimo was a German cargo ship built in 1914 and then sold to the Hudson's Bay Company as a war reparation in 1921. She spent the next decade uh, plying the waters between Scotland and Northern Canada. She was used to transport furs and for trading with Inuit settlements in the Arctic regions of North America. In late September 1931, Beichimo was struck by a blizzard near Point Barrow in Alaska, and on the 1st of October, she became stuck in pack ice. The crew, fearful for their lives and knowing that the ship could remain stuck for some time, chose to leave the ship and march across the ice to the town of Barrow. For the next month and a half, they would regularly return and try and clear away the ice from the hull until on the 24th of November, another blizzard struck the region. Afterwards, when the crew returned to the Beichimo to try and get her free of the ice, they found that she was actually missing. At first, they assumed that she had just sunk in the storm, but they soon received word from a hunter that the ship was in fact still afloat and had somehow drifted over 70 kilometers or 43 miles to the south. The crew tracked her down once again and managed to remove the cargo of furs from her hold before flying back to Vancouver and declaring the ship a total loss. This should have been the end for the Beichimo. It was unmanned and trapped in ice. And by all reasonable metrics, it should have just sunk a few weeks or months into the Arctic conditions. And yet, despite being abandoned and declared a loss by the company, the Beichimo would remain afloat for the next 38 years. The first sighting of the ghost ship came in 1932, when it was seen once again, having drifted 500 kilometers or 300 miles to the east, floating silently and completely intact. There were multiple sightings that year from dog sleds and prospectors. In 1933, a group of indigenous people stumbled across the trapped ship in a blizzard and took shelter on board for 10 days until the storm passed. The ship may have actually saved their lives, despite being abandoned and drifting through ice packs. Word had spread by now that the ship was still afloat, but the Hudson's Bay Company did not have any interest in trying to salvage her. And privately, some tried, but the thick ice in the area and dangerous weather meant that no attempt was ever successful. There were no more sightings for over 20 years between the late 30s and early 60s, but in 1962, she was finally spotted again, drifting off Alaska's northern coast. It was incredible that after 30 years of abandonment and horrendous conditions, the Beichimo was still afloat and in good condition. The last known sighting of the Beichimo occurred in 1969, when she was found having been trapped in ice once more between Point Barrow and Icy Cape. And though she has not been seen since, she has remained a famous ship for her almost 40 years, having remained afloat on her own, sailing up and down Alaska's coast and surviving decades of ice and disrepair. Unfortunately, it's now very likely that the ship has finally sunk because there haven't been any sightings of her since the late 60s. But in 2006, the Alaskan government began searching for all the wreckages of the thousands of lost ships in the north. Perhaps one day soon, we'll learn where the final resting place of the Beichimo really is. Now, before we go on with this video, and don't you dare think about skipping this part, because I will take it personally. This year, my business, Ocean Liner Designs, is turning five years old, which means that uh, if it were a kid, it'd be able to talk by now, which is kind of scary. I think it's five years ago, I started my own website with Squarespace, and I've been recommending it to people ever since. Genuinely, I'm not just being paid to say this, I've recommended it to people at parties and meetings and things when they ask what they should use to build a website or what I use to build mine, because it looks really nice. Squarespace is really graphical. The photographs and the images look spectacular. If you wanted to run a blog or give people your personal thoughts or share your artwork or sell products, I can't think of a better platform than Squarespace. I've used it to sell prints now for five years and they look really, really nice on the website. The other thing that's really great are the analytics. Around the world, I can see what countries they're visiting from. I can see what devices they're using to get on my website and then kind of like change the design accordingly. Another thing that's really great are the blogging tools. I've written articles on Squarespace that have then become scripts that I've turned into videos for my YouTube channel. Again, it's all graphical. The photographs look beautiful. Go give it a try. Really recommend it. Make your own website today. Visit the link right here in the description of this video to receive a discount on your first URL or website purchase. When you have made your website with Squarespace, put it in the comments of this video and tag me in it and I'll go and check it out. 
Number three, the Carol A. Deering. The Carol A. Deering was a five-masted schooner sailing ship built for the G.G. Deering Company out of the US. The ship was doomed to live a short life, operating as a cargo ship for only a year before it was found with its entire crew missing, drifting into port in North Carolina. In January 1921, the Carol A. Deering was making a routine journey from Barbados to Norfolk. With 12 men on board and a short trip, it should have been a simple journey. Sure, at first, all things seemed to be going well. On the 29th of January, the ship passed by the Cape Lookout Lightship in North Carolina. The men on board reported that they had lost their anchors, but didn't mention any other issues. And besides, losing an anchor was fairly common back in the day, but just a few days later, on the 31st, the ship was seen drifting off Cape Hatteras. The sails were set, and the ship appeared in good condition to the observers on the shore. There was, however, one strange detail. There didn't appear to be a single person on board. The ship soon wrecked itself against the rocks off the coast, and members of the Coast Guard boarded it. On board, they found food prepared that had never been eaten, and the lifeboats were missing. The ship's log and navigational equipment was gone, as were the crew's personal belongings. Rumours immediately spread through the region, and conflicting theories emerged about what exactly had happened to the crew. Mutiny was chosen by the newspapers as the most likely scenario, but there was no reason that a mutinous crew would abandon a perfectly good ship. And why so close to their destination? Another suggestion was that pirates had taken over the ship. After all, another vessel, the Hewitt, had gone missing around the same time. Maybe there was a connection between the two. The mystery remained unanswered, and the wreckage stayed on the rocks offshore until on the 4th of March, the Coast Guard loaded it with dynamite and blew it up in order to prevent the wreckage from dislodging and becoming a danger to passing ships. There were no further leads until April of that year. A message in a bottle was found by a passerby on the beach allegedly from the crew of the Deering that told a compelling story. It said, Deering captured by oil burning vessel, something like a chaser, taking off everything and handcuffing the crew, crew hiding all over the ship, but no chance to escape. That was taken up by the newspapers of the time and all of a sudden the Russian communists were considered for the cause of the disappearances. There was a great deal of paranoia at the time about communist subversion of the United States and there were rumours that they were plotting to steal American ships and cargo to sail them back to the newly formed Soviet Union. It was discovered in September, however, that the message in a bottle was actually a forgery from the very same man who had found it. He was attempting to get a job at a nearby lighthouse, although I'm not entirely sure why he thought the bottle would help, but anyway. With that, the communist pirate's theory fell out of favour. The most likely explanation is probably also the most boring. Severe weather off the coast forced the ship near a sandbar, and the crew probably made the poor decision to abandon ship, rather risking being stranded during a storm. This would explain why the lifeboats were missing along with the crew. That or she actually did stick fast on a sandbar, but the ship may have been freed by the waves and rode off on the currents without her crew. To this day, the answer to what exactly happened to the crew of the Carol A. Deering is unknown, because the ship's boats and the bodies of the crew were never seen again. Number two, the Copenhagen. Now, the Copenhagen was a magnificent five-masted Danish sailing vessel built in 1921. It was used as a naval training ship, but also carried cargo such as wheat to help cover costs. When it was completed, the Copenhagen was the largest sailing ship in the world and was quite famous for this. She sailed the oceans for the next seven years, even circumnavigating the globe and remaining a popular attraction in every port she sailed into. Finally, in 1928, she set out on what would be her last voyage. On the 14th of December that year, the Copenhagen left Buenos Aires and sailing for my hometown, Melbourne, Australia, on a voyage that was expected to take a little over a month and a half. The last time anybody heard from the ship or any of those aboard was on the 22nd of December, when the Copenhagen radioed a nearby steamer reporting their location and indicating that all was well. Captain Anderson was in command of the vessel and being a bit of an old sea dog traditionalist was notorious for his sparse use of the wireless radio. As the Copenhagen was a sailing ship, there was also no guarantee that winds would be suitable for a quick journey. So all this meant that there was not really a great deal of concern when the ship hadn't been heard from by January. In February though, concerns were being raised, but there was no reason to panic just yet. And finally, in April, when it was clear that nobody had heard from the Copenhagen since December the last year, that it was not going to be coming into port, the Danish government finally sent a ship out to search for the missing vessel. There were strange reports from the island of Triste de Cunha in the South Atlantic. A school teacher had seen a ghostly sailing ship with a broken foremast sailing past the island with no crew on board. He described it to the Times like this. 
The sea was rough for our boats and we could do nothing but watch her gradually crawl past and run inside the reefs to the west of the island. She was certainly in distress. She was using only one small jib and her stern was very low in the water. The ship had drifted within a few hundred meters of the shoreline before being caught by the wind and sailing further to the east until she was out of sight. Days later, the inhabitants of the island would find boxes and an abandoned lifeboat caught in a reef near the island. Despite this lead, no sign of the ship or any of its 79-man crew were found by the Danish government and she was declared officially lost in 1930. Sightings of the Copenhagen would continue for years after she was declared lost, with reports of abandoned sailing ships matching her description coming from as far abroad as Chile. Now, the most common theory is that the Copenhagen uh, hit an iceberg and sank, and that the ship sighted off Trista da Cunha was not the Copenhagen at all, but rather a different sailing ship that had been in the area on the same day. But that doesn't account for the poor condition as described by the schoolteacher. Also, there's a compelling reason to believe that an iceberg is responsible. In 1934, a diary was found on Bouvet Island, apparently from a trainee on board the Copenhagen, who had written that the ship was struck by an iceberg and the crew was forced to abandon her. Meanwhile, in Australia, a Finnish ship claimed to have found the wreckage, seeing a ship with Copenhagen written on her stern. Finally, in 1935, a lifeboat was found on the beach in what is now Namibia, about 400 miles north of Swakopmund. Seven skeletons were inside, dressed in Nordic uniforms. Were these from the Copenhagen? And if so, how would a wrecked ship and its crew be found scattered thousands of miles apart from one another on different continents? The answer remains a mystery. Number 1. The MV Joyita The MV Joyita was a luxury yacht built for an American movie director before being sold to the US Navy during the Second World War. In 1948, she was sold to the Louis Brothers, who added a cork lining to the ship's hull and used her in Samoa as a charter vessel. On the 3rd of October 1955, the Joyita pulled out of Apia and set sail for the Tokelau Islands in New Zealand. It was a journey of about 400 kilometers or 248 miles, and was expected to take two days. One of the Joyita's two engines had actually failed before leaving, so the ship was already in a bad state when it finally left the harbor. Nevertheless, it pressed on with its 25 crew and passengers on board, including two children. No one would ever see any of these people ever again. On the 6th of October, the ship was reported overdue, and rescue vessels searched the sea between Samoa and the Tokelau Islands to no avail. The ship was declared lost until, on the 10th of November, a merchant ship sighted the stricken vessel, listing heavily, partially underwater, and devoid of any crew or passengers. The Joyita was 600 miles off course off the coast of Fiji. When a rescue team boarded the vessel, they found the radio was tuned to the International Marine Distress Signal. Clearly, they had been trying to call for help. The logbook, sextant, and all three lifeboats were missing. More concerningly though, the ship's bridge had been destroyed and the windows broken. When the doctor's bag was found, there were bloody bandages inside. There was also more than four tons of cargo missing from the hold. Barnacle growth on one side told salvagers that the ship had been listing onto its port side for weeks. The ship was towed into Suva and examined by an inquiry team. The amount of fuel left in the tank should probably not been more than 50 miles from its destination when the disaster had struck. An inquiry found that a block drain in the bilge had caused the hull to fill with water, causing the heavy listing. The cork lining that had been installed a few years earlier, however, had kept enough buoyancy in the ship to keep it afloat, even with the water it had taken on. The radio was also broken, with a range that was limited to no more than two miles from the ship. And there was never a chance of help reaching them, as nobody could receive their signals. An inquiry did find that a single engine would not have been enough to control the ship with that amount of water on board. The ship may have been struck by a storm, filling the hull with water. To the passengers, and possibly even the crew, the list might have made the ship appear to be sinking. It's possible that the captain ordered the ship abandoned, which explained why the lifeboats were missing. Another possible explanation is the captain had been incapacitated or killed, which had caused a panic on board. Now, this would explain the bloody bandages, and why the passengers and crew had abandoned ship when the cork was still keeping it afloat, something the captain would have known about and factored into his decision making if he was capable. Some more outlandish theories included being kidnapped by Soviets, again with the Soviets, murder from Japanese army holdouts still active in the region, and even pirates. These answers would explain why the cargo was missing from the hull, after all. Another explanation is that the crew simply engaged in a mutiny against a captain who they thought was incompetent. After the broken engine and radio, and leading the ship into a storm that caused the vessel to list, the crew lost faith and took over. With only one engine, the mutineers took everyone in the lifeboats and tried to reach a nearby island, before being swept away by the ocean. To this day, no one's sure exactly what happened to the people on board. 
Now the damage to the bridge and the bloody bandages actually remind me a little bit of the recovered lifeboat and block and tackle of the ship the MV München which went missing and the damage showed evidence of contact with a rogue wave. If Joyita was in rough weather and a group of waves banded together to form one monstrous wave it could have smashed with extreme force over the bow of the ship crushing the bridge and seriously wounding anybody inside. With the captain and any senior crew killed or badly hurt the survivors would have been dazed and terrified as their ship rolled over. They might have hurriedly filled a boat to escape and been lost at sea. This doesn't really explain the cargo though. Maybe the ship was rolled over by the wave, had its hatch broken and the cargo spilled out. In any case, after being recovered, the Joyita was repaired and used as a trading vessel, but she was repeatedly run aground on reefs and finally became abandoned one last time. She was stripped of valuable fittings and what remained of her simply disintegrated into the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.